All right, Destiny Addicts, you're gonna love this one. This video is brought to you by the new limited edition range of Steel Series Destiny 2 peripherals. I've got a sweet discount lined up for you on these ones, so stick around to the end of the video to learn more. All right, so let me start by saying that this video is full of stuff that I think the majority of people playing Destiny are not gonna agree with. That's fine, by the way, we all have our opinions. Mine is no more right or important than anyone else's. I'm just some random nerd with a YouTube account, so don't worry too much about what I think. This is important because the overwhelming majority of people are agreed that Destiny is in a really good spot right now. In fact, most people will say that the Destiny franchise has never been in a better spot. The success of the seasonal model last year was spectacular, and to many, the Witch Queen felt like this culmination, delivering missions, lore, core gameplay, and game systems that really elevated Destiny and positioned it strongly as it raises the curtain on this final act of the Light and Dark saga. In addition, Destiny as a franchise has rarely been as strong by the numbers. Over 1 million people pre-ordered the Witch Queen expansion, and while concurrent player counts on Steam are an inelegant metric, they're generally pretty useful, and they paint a clear picture of a franchise not only performing strongly, but also one in ascendancy, no pun intended. Even critics, who are generally a mix of either disinterested or ambivalent towards Destiny, are loving it. The Witch Queen expansion sits at 88 on Open Critic, making this expansion one of the highest rated releases of the year, and yeah, it's only February, but very few games hit 88 on Open Critic at all, so that statement is not just a function of the Witch Queen's release timing. So Destiny is riding high right now, and the purpose of this video is not to say, actually, Destiny sucks, because I don't think it sucks. At all. I think it's super cool and I love it because Destiny is just in me at this point and try as I might, nothing's gonna change that anytime soon. However, I do find myself in a very different position from where the consensus has landed, the one that says Destiny has never been in a better spot. I really do not agree with that, and while Destiny has certainly been in a worse spot in the past, I do look at where the game is now and where it's going and I have some concerns. If we're to evaluate the Witch Queen expansion alone, particularly its campaign, that's a huge success story, and an important one, because its legendary difficulty showed us a vision of Destiny that fully functioned in a way that this game does not fully function across most of its activities. The Strike playlist does not work, it is not properly balanced for our current power. The Seasonal activity does not work, it is not balanced for our power level. The Destination activities like patrols and public events do not work. They are not balanced for our power level. Since Destiny 2 launched, we have become vastly more powerful, but most of the game has not been rebalanced around this new power level, and so huge chunks of this game just aren't playable, and I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but you literally cannot play the normal strike playlist right now because one dude will just sword skate ahead, kill everything before you get there, and when you get pulled to the boss room, the boss will die before his spawn in animation has concluded. Void 3.0 is being hailed as a massive success. But I think it's a massive problem, because all of your abilities are so potent and on such short cooldowns that this not only supercharges this power creep issue, but it also makes gunplay less important than it has ever been in the history of this franchise. When I close my eyes and think about playing Destiny 1, I hear the sound of my Tlaloc as it fires, and I recall the exact bounce of my vision of confluence as I chained headshots with it. When I think about playing Destiny 2 now, I think about blind firing an SMG that melts targets 30 meters away while I spam grenades every 6 seconds that explodes 2, 3, 4 waves of enemies. That's its own sort of fun, sure, but there's a balance that Void 3.0 does not strike and I think it's done more harm than good. There are other core challenges with this game at this point. Gambit does not work, for like a billion reasons, and that activity is now so bad that more than a few people are pleading with Bungie to put it in the content vault so that it can be either permanently decommissioned or entirely reworked. PvP has always been a mixed bag, but even with recent improvements to Trials, the dearth of meaningful PvP content is now in its third straight year. The new player experience is not good, and getting worse with every piece of content that is removed from the game, and it remains very difficult to recommend Destiny to anyone not already playing it. This list of issues does not take away from the many successes that the Witch Queen campaign offers up. Easily the best campaign in the history of this franchise, some fantastic, rewarding storytelling, a solid six-player activity, and as always, an absolutely brilliant raid encounter. 
but despite these accomplishments, I can't stop thinking about how hard it was to find activities that I can fully enjoy without needing to forgive them their compromised components. I can't stop asking myself, where the hell am I going to use all this power I've now got? Because there are vanishingly few places in this game that are properly balanced to handle what my Guardian is now capable of. It may seem unfair to list all of these things when there's only so much that a single expansion can do, and certainly some of my issues with where Destiny is at at the moment are whole of game challenges rather than specific to the Witch Queen, but I've always viewed these reviews of major expansions as a checkpoint in the life of the franchise, and while I saw Forsaken as a triumphant writing of the ship, and I saw Beyond Light as stumbling first steps into a post-Activision world, I look at Witch Queen as an expansion that has pushed Destiny's activities and core gameplay past breaking point. Even when Destiny 2 first launched with its double primaries and its long ability cooldowns, the game worked. It wasn't fun, but it worked. I don't think Destiny 2 properly works right now, and as much as I enjoyed those campaign missions, I don't think this expansion does enough to fix what doesn't work about Destiny, and in at least some aspects, the Witch Queen expansion has made things worse. So protective of your traveler. But you wouldn't let me keep it safe. The game is yours to play now. I want to use this block to talk about the new content that the Witch Queen expansion has delivered. The campaign, the throne world, and the raid. We'll do the campaign first. Having now played through the Witch Queen's legendary campaign twice, once with two other mates and once solo, I can't recall a more significant and timely addition to the franchise than this campaign at the legendary difficulty. The Witch Queen's legendary campaign is so good that it feels like it's from a different video game, and it kind of is at this point, since so much of it is built on a mission design framework that we've never seen before, and on a difficulty model that doesn't presently exist across any other part of the game. Previous Destiny campaigns range from really bad to pretty good, but that assessment of being pretty good was very much couched in the fact that Destiny was a looter shooter rather than a single player FPS like Doom or Halo's cinematic campaigns. We may look back fondly on Forsaken as being a good campaign, and it was, but not a single level in that campaign holds a candle to even an average Halo level. With a few exceptions, Destiny's campaign missions lacked curated encounters, set-piece moments, unique mechanics, and interesting boss design. Like I said, they were good in the looter-shooter context, but remove that context and comparisons become a lot less flattering. The Witch Queen's legendary campaign was so good that I would be proud to put it before a discerning FPS fan and say, check this out. I would love to see them explore these massive spaces. I would love to see the surprise on their face as they beat a boss encounter and learn that that was just a checkpoint and there are still two more bosses in that level alone. I would love to see them contend with the lethality of Lucent Hive Guardians. I would love to see them solve puzzles and respond on the fly to newly discovered mechanics or run that breathless gauntlet at the end of the cunning and just so many other moments. I myself could not believe what I was seeing as I was playing through this. We would push through these incredible challenging encounters and I'd be like, phew, thank god that's over but then the level would still have like 40 minutes worth of stuff to go there are eight missions here and they'll take you an average of 45 minutes to an hour each and they're so dense with tense encounters and meaningful story reveals and set piece moments that you just want to do it all over again because there's so much fun for real i've done it twice now once on my titan and again on my lock I cannot wait to play through it on my Hunter. Doing campaigns on your ults was often this chore because you'd kind of already seen all the new stuff and you knew all the story beats, so you were kind of just going through the motions, but the legendary missions play so well that you want to play them again. I was so excited when I came up to certain missions the second time I did them because I was like, oh yeah, I love this part. And that was such a treat to be giddy with excitement about a Destiny campaign mission. Like, what the fuck is that? When has that ever happened? The foundation for this success is Bungie adopting a totally different paradigm of mission design. Missions are longer, they are bigger, they have more enemies, more boss encounters, they have more mechanics. And those mechanics aren't exactly raid level, but they're on their way toward that. And this entire campaign is this right the way through. There isn't a single moment where you're sent off to farm public events or do playlist activities to pad things out. Bungie have never tried to deliver so much in a single campaign, and they hit the objectives so comprehensively that there was no room left for filler bullshit. It was just 
the campaign was chock full, man. That was it. But as cool as all of this was, it wasn't as important as the addition of the legendary difficulty. Campaign missions are just that, campaign missions. Their impact across the rest of the game is more limited, but the legendary difficulty has the potential to radically transform and revitalize Destiny at a time when I think it desperately needs that sort of revivication. As I'll explain throughout the rest of this review, I think there is a crisis brewing at the core of Destiny's gameplay. I think the difficulty delta between match-made playlist activities and pre-made endgame activities is too vast. And at the bottom end of the spectrum, Destiny is feeling increasingly mindless and spammy. Enemies die too fast, ability cooldowns are too short, gunplay is not important enough. None of these concerns exist here in the Legendary Difficulty Mode. Every enemy feels like it has just the right amount of health to require focused fire without feeling spongy. Enemy damage output is threatening without feeling oppressive. Enemy density is on point. The checkpointing and revive system engenders careful play without pushing you into overly cautious turtling. This is so important to me because this is pretty much exactly how I like Destiny to feel. And it should be possible for Destiny to feel like this across every part of the game. Not all the times, there should be some easier difficulties and there should be some harder ones. But that middle ground is missing right now across strikes, gambit, open world spaces, seasonal activities. If I want Destiny to feel good at the moment, I have to go on an LFG Discord and group up with random people for content that doesn't even require any coordination. Why? Why is the default difficulty of Destiny currently brain dead easy mode? This should be the default difficulty of Destiny, and if people want to make it easier or harder, then they can, but this should be it. As our power continues to grow, especially under Void 3.0, I felt increasingly disconnected from the core gameplay loop that first made me fall in love with Destiny. Playing through this legendary campaign was this revelatory reconnection. I fought so hard through these levels, and in a far more organic and interesting way than trying to burst down champions or cowering in fear from the dregs who can one-shot me in GM Nightfalls. So while the campaign was bigger, more focused, and more epic than anything we'd ever seen before, the legendary difficulty itself is the most important addition to this game that the Witch Queen expansion makes. Thrilling lore nerds and casual cutscene skippers alike, Bungie's commitment to lucid in-game storytelling is pretty rad. For new players who spent years hearing about how bad Destiny storytelling is, or for returning players who are accustomed to Bungie's more circumspect approach to narrative, the sheer volume of cutscenes and reveals may come as a bit of a shock. But for those of us who've been playing Destiny this past year as the seasonal storylines completely upended both the Destiny universe and our expectations of Bungie's approach to storytelling, the Witch Queen campaign is less of a surprise. Destiny's lore has always been worth paying attention to, but since last year the in-game storytelling has been equally worthwhile, and Bungie have found the right formula for storytelling in their universe, surfacing the most important and dramatic elements of the story through in-game events, while using the game's lore entries to deepen the universe and foreshadow future events. I've always believed that Destiny's world is worth learning about if you're already playing the game, but it wasn't itself a reason to play Destiny. Over the last year, continuing into the Witch Queen expansion, story has become one of the principal reasons that we log in each week. Weekly Reset isn't just about your pinnacle grind, it's about progressing your seasonal quest so you can reach the next major story reveal or cutscene. That's a huge transformation for this franchise, and I'm really excited to see what future seasons and expansions bring on the storytelling front, especially as we enter this final act of the Light and Dark Saga. The Witch Queen expansion takes place on Sabathun's throne world, and it is beautiful, but it's also a testament to an outdated approach to destination design. As with pretty much every destination in Destiny 2, Bungie has created this expansive space but only uses a tiny fraction of it as an open world destination. The rest of it, you never need to visit it. Ever. It's just wasted space that is utilized in some campaign missions, but it feels like such a tremendous waste to utilize these spaces so sparingly. Worse though is the fact that there's just nothing here to kill. There's like five enemies in each of the throne world's regions at any one time. I pick up patrol bounties to kill stuff and it takes like 10 minutes because I'm sitting there waiting for stuff to respawn. I mean, I might be okay with this if this was the Cosmodrome where newbies start out, but this is Savathun's throne world, man. This should be a dangerous place. I'm more likely to die in the tower than I am here in the throne world. And that's just silly. It doesn't help that these enemies that are on the throne world crumple like tissue paper if I so much as glance in their general direction. 
As I will mention many times in this video, the difficulty balancing of these activities is no longer working. Spending time in these spaces is boring because everything dies so fast. Even heroic public events are just a complete joke at this point. There needs to be a rebalancing of all destinations to make them enjoyable to play. Because right now they look and feel like they're still in development. Like Bungie have built the topography and just dumped in some placeholder enemies to denote where actual combat encounters might one day go. Thankfully Bungie have listened to prior feedback on the subject and the destination activity is a 6 player match made one. That'd be pretty cool if it didn't suffer from the same difficulty scaling issues that plague the whole game. Normal mode Wellspring is just spammy face roll, requiring no thought, you just press buttons and you get some loot. The master difficulty is more interesting than that, but to do that you need to go on an LFG discord and rope in 5 other players to do something that again, does not require any coordination or communication. This should be the default match made difficulty for this experience, and then there should be an easy mode for people who prefer that. The final experience that the throne world serves up is the raid, the vow of the disciple. It's rare that Bungie make a bad raid, they're all pretty special in their own way, and Vow of the Disciple absolutely earns its place among the best raid experiences that Bungie has ever served up. Visually, I think it's the most epic or inspiring raid location to date, with the deeds and trophies of its occupants adorning the walls, and the mother of worm gods herself held captive below. Even if you're not someone who's naturally drawn to Destiny's lore, this raid is so dripping with it that you can't help but get some of it on you. Truly a new bar for environmental storytelling in a franchise that has always excelled at that. The encounter design here is also a spectacular success. Destiny raids are a balancing act between convoluted mechanics and straight up DPS checks, between a difficulty bar that challenges people and one that makes LFG pickup groups possible. On balance, the raid feels really good because the mechanics demand a lot of coordination and throughput without being finicky. Looking at you, Garden of Salvation tethers. There is still a question of baseline difficulty as it relates to non-boss enemies. When you're fighting regular enemies, it's a total cakewalk. Complete AFK, face roll spam, it's really just about going through the motions while you complete the mechanics. You'll almost never die to anything other than a raid wipe because someone didn't laser the Taken Knight fast enough. Master Raid difficulty is meant to be the premiere raid difficulty that launches soon, so I don't know how that's gonna go, but if it's anything like Master Vault of Glass, then fuck that. That was just so not fun. Stuff does not become more fun when you cram lots of champions into it. The legendary difficulty model provides a vastly more interesting template for what raids could be, just like they used to be back in Destiny 1 hard mode raids. That was fine. I still don't understand why we can't just go back to something like that, especially now that this legendary difficulty has shown us how this game can feel challenging without relying on the crutch that champions have become. The Witch Queen expansion is more than just these elements, but these things, the campaign, the throne world, and the raid, represent the new playable content that this expansion serves up. It is less content than what some previous expansions have served up, but Bungie is a smaller studio now since it lost satellite support from the likes of High Moon and Vicarious Visions. Still, I don't think anyone can look at this offering and feel shortchanged. There is a brilliant 8 hour long campaign here, a range of post campaign quests to send you into the throne world, and a fantastic raid that you're going to run at least once but probably a few dozen times as you chase weapons and armor and the ever elusive exotic. And after that there's all the seasonal content which is separate from the expansion but still connected in terms of how we actually play the game. Bungie have delivered a great expansion by almost every metric, but they delivered us an extraordinary campaign in that legendary difficulty. And I really hope that it serves as the anchor point for a broader rebalancing of the entire game's difficulty, because right now, Destiny desperately needs that. Each new expansion brings new marquee game features, and this time around, Bungie have delivered us weapon crafting. I'm trying to recall whether or not weapon crafting has been a highly requested feature over the life of this franchise, and I don't think it has. I definitely don't recall a critical mass of people calling for some sort of system that would allow us to create our own weapons. I definitely do recall plenty of calls for more flexible weapon customization and refinement. The ability to re-roll our armor stats with glass needles was a much loved system, one that people still want to see return. The ability to select from a pool of weapon perks for our drops was one of the few redeeming aspects of Season of the Hunt. 
The drops at the end of the splicer missions that had selectable weapon perks were awesome. I kind of think that the language matters here because I really wouldn't call what we've got in the Witch Queen weapon crafting, since you're not really crafting a weapon that is at all distinct. You're just selecting the perks from an existing weapon. It's a more flexible weapon customization system rather than weapon crafting per se. So that in itself is a little bit of a disappointment to be honest. I do think you could have arrived at some sort of weapon crafting system that would have allowed us to combine the visual elements of weapons together to create something visually distinct. Perhaps some custom shader thing allowing us to set shader panels. Maybe we could, like, I don't know, write the lore entries for our own guns. Hell, we can't even name the weapons we craft. That alone is the biggest missed opportunity in this whole system. Imagine being in PvP and getting killed by an auto rifle called Rick's Pickle. That alone would have justified the expansion's price tag. As a concept, separate from the actual execution of it, the current iteration of weapon crafting is just fine, I guess. I can guarantee myself god roll weapons if I grind enough, with some slightly better perks thrown in. That's essentially what it boils down to, right? Is it a system that excites and engages me? Not really. Is it something I think makes Destiny better? Not really. Most people who are playing a moderate amount of Destiny are gonna get pretty close to god rolls on most of the weapons they're chasing anyway. The enhanced perks provide only minimal incremental power. I think the real test for a system like this is, do any of the weapons that I craft feel like they are mine? Like I crafted them and they don't. They're still Bungie's weapons. I just get to choose the perks that are on them. That's all. Separate from the concept is the execution of this new system. And that is just so, so awful to the point where an overhaul of it has already been announced. And one of the reasons that I'm not loving the Witch Queen is that I'm pretty over this dance that we do with Bungie every time they introduce a new feature. Because obviously this sucks. Like the fact that we have eight new currencies or something to track and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to which weapons drop which currencies and the absurdly low resource caps and we can't even fucking see how much of each resource we're carrying because the UI doesn't support that and we have to keep weapons in our vault as a means of stockpiling these resources. This whole system is just terrible. And yeah, while this review was being written, Bungie did announce that most of the currencies would be scrapped. And they explained that the reason we're in this mess is because originally there were even more currencies. One for each perk, my god, can you imagine? Right now, weapon crafting is characterized more by the frustration it causes than the chase it engenders. It has too many currencies, the UI is not fit for purpose, the currency caps are not appropriate, and the payoff just isn't there. Even after the currency changes Bungie are about to make, there will almost certainly be significant reworking of every other part of this system over the coming months. So I'm kind of just piecing out on this whole thing until it gets fixed, which, yeah, that's a shame given that this is a shiny new feature that should be immediately fun when we first engage it. Assuming that overhauling does take place, I do think that there are some deeper challenges within this system that are gonna be much more difficult to fix. Firstly, I don't think any crafting system that renders other drops useless belongs in Destiny. So right now I have a crafted shotgun, the Ragnil D. If any other Ragnil D drops for me, it's immediately trash. I don't even have to look at the roll. I can immediately dismantle it because I know that with minimal effort, I can get the same roll or better. And with a little more effort, I can get enhanced perks, which are a nice little top up. I don't think that's where the system should have landed. I think it's important that Bungie protect the value of the drop. There are a lot of ways that this could have been done, such as, I don't know, crafting weapons being totally separate from drops or enhanced perks could also appear on weapon drops, like the old masterwork drops from back in the day. I don't know, I'm not a game designer. I'm just saying that right now, I don't care about any drop for any craftable weapon, and that's not good. Secondly, the entire system of using the red trim weapons to harvest currencies, that really blows. I remember when I reviewed Forsaken, one thing that I really appreciated was the overlapping economy of rewards, which is to say that if I did a round of Gambit, I was doing bounties for that, plus gunsmith bounties. I was also progressing some exotic quest requirement. I was earning reputation. It all just kind of lined up. Right now, I'm feeling like Destiny's reward economy has a lot more tension built into it. Between seasonal challenges, weekly quests, reputation grinds, bounties, exotic quest progress, exotic catalyst grinds, triumphs, there's a lot that asks you to play in a particular way to make progress, and it can feel like a little much, but even then it all still kind of hangs together. Leveling up these shitty weapons with shitty rolls so that I can feed this shitty weapons crafting economy, that part feels like a bridge too far. That's where I hit the wall. 
If I want to level up my shotgun and make it stronger, then I should just be able to use it. And that should be it. I shouldn't have to use some crappy sidearm in random activities for 20 minutes to gather resources that I can then spend to make my shotgun stronger. It feels forced. It's pulling me away from my desired builds and playstyle and weapons in a way that I don't enjoy. And it, combined with the resource cap issues, is fueling a lot of the frustration I'm feeling towards weapon crafting as it currently exists. I have no doubt that in the years to come, weapon crafting will be a vastly improved, indispensable part of the Destiny experience. It's a feature that just kind of feels like it belongs in the game, right? So I'm glad that Bungie have begun this journey. But like I said, within one or two days of engaging this system, we were immediately able to see all of its shortcomings and limitations. Bungie would have seen all of this as well in the months and months of design work and playtesting that would have gone into this feature, and yet here we are with what feels like an alpha level feature for a release candidate product. That is a common theme with new offerings from Bungie, and I'm just a little bit over that at this point, to be honest. So this is going to be the least popular part of the review because everyone's going to disagree with this, but that's okay. Here's my take. I really don't like Void 3.0 and I think it's bad for the game. So last year, Stasis arrived and it was the first of the revised subclass models powered by more in-depth customization. Destiny 2 at launch made the regrettable choice of greatly streamlining our subclass builds into set trees with clusters of perks, and Stasis was the opening salvo in the effort to dig the game out of that design hole. The customization baked into Stasis was absolutely superb. It was so deep, so meaningful. The fragments you selected would radically transform your moment-to-moment -moment play, opening up build diversity in a way that Destiny 2 had never seen before. Destiny is a franchise had never seen before. But it was the gameplay impact of Stasis that was the real game changer. And I think it took us all a little while to catch up and realize just how good it was. At the launch of Beyond Light, I remember thinking, oh, the Titan Stasis kind of sucks, right? But that was before I really understood the zone control potential of Stasis Crystals and how much CC was baked into these builds and how powerful that could be in higher level content. Obviously, it was a complete catastrophe on the PvP side of the game, but on the PvE front, Stasis was a revelation because it was an entirely new model of power, one that allowed you to dynamically reshape and control the battlefield in a way that no other subclass had ever been capable of. It gave you so much bonus power, but it was intelligently delivered, pushing you into new patterns of play and enlarging Destiny's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. So, here we are at Void 3.0. Let's take a look at what my Barricade now does. Barricade was an ability that was already on an extremely short cooldown. It erected a shield wall in front of me that would block all frontal damage. I could also use a rally version of it, which was smaller, but would increase my reload speed, stability, and range. It also damages and stuns any enemy that walks through it. Now, with Void 3.0, the Barricade has all of that, but it immediately grants me an overshield whenever I pop it, instantly. That's not all. It also grants that overshield to my fire team members. Okay, but that's not all. It also regens that overshield so long as I sit behind that wall. Okay. Oh, and I can also mod it to significantly reduce the cooldown of my grenades, increase my melee damage and range, give me another melee charge, and increase the duration of my overshield. Oh, and by the way, I can really easily mod and gear myself so that I have 100% uptime on my barricade. So now I have the strategy that I use in pretty much any match made activity, so strikes or wellspring or psyops or battlegrounds or whatever, and I just stand in the middle of everything and I put my barricade down and then I just start shooting stuff and throwing my grenades and my shields. After my barricade expires, I just put it straight down again because the cooldown lets me do that and I just keep doing that until everything is dead. When I said I shoot stuff though, I should be more specific. I kind of point my weapon in the general direction of enemies and then they just explode because I've got this volatile rounds perk which basically turns everything into an exploding corpse so long as I kill it with a void weapon and I've got this SMG that doesn't really even need to be aimed down sights to melt stuff. Hipfire is fine. My grenade is similarly stacked. It sucks in enemies, it lasts for a really long time, it kills everything, and then it causes them to explode, killing everything else nearby. And it just continues to chain so many kills, one after the other. My shield throw, same deal. Uh, if I can get one kill with it, the enemy will explode and wipe out an entire cluster of enemies with a single throw, all while reducing the timer on my grenade cooldown, so I have that up as well all the time. So this is fun, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess. I definitely am on the record as really enjoying how much bonus power we got last year during Beyond Light. 
it, it felt a bit latent up until Battleground showed up because we had all this power, but we didn't really have anywhere to use it. And then Battlegrounds came and it was like, oh cool, yes, finally time to unleash. And that was great. We should feel powerful as Guardians. And I think last year we did. But by the end of the year, I was getting worried about where all this was going. I remember tweeting about my concerns about the Vex Mythoclast and Particle Acceleration meta. I'm like, Vex is too strong and you just hold down the button and everything dies. I got super roasted for that on Twitter. Lots of dragging in the QRTs, but yeah, man, I, I was enjoying the game less because I didn't have to properly play it anymore. Vex would just play it for me. Here in Void 3.0, things are worse. Like, ask yourself, do we really need our barricade to do all of that stuff at once? I don't personally. I think that's too much. It's trivializing the majority of content and it's making Destiny feel really mindless. I know more than a few people will say that the game is now balanced around higher level content like GM Nightfalls and Master Raids. Okay, well if Bungie is balancing the game around that now, and I don't think they are by the way, but if they are, is that right? Should it be balanced around content that only a small percentage of players are completing and only complete a handful of times? 95% of the Destiny content you will play through in a given week is not that content. So is it right that everything else should feel like this? I don't think so. I know as well that some people will say that it's unfair to judge Void 3.0 until the other subclasses have been revised. But Stasis has already been revised. And who the fuck is using Stasis now? I haven't seen anyone using it in the open world, in matchmade activities, in raids, anywhere. If a newly revised subclass is so strong that it immediately smothers the existence of every other subclass, including a revised subclass, then surely there's a balance problem, right? Finally, and I think most importantly, this really got me thinking about how much of a relationship we have with our weapons now. Destiny's movement, locomotion, gunplay, the kinesthetic link between player and character has forever been the hallmark of this franchise. That's like the first thing I said in the very first Destiny video I ever made. And I've been saying it in every video since then, even when I was deeply critical of the state of the franchise. But for the first time ever, I'm feeling like Destiny's core gameplay is weakening owing to this ability-driven sandbox significantly reducing the value of gunplay. Like, think about it this way. Which weapons are you liking this season and why? Have you found a scout rifle that you can't put down? Is there a new hand cannon you're in love with or a pulse rifle or something, a shotgun? I certainly haven't had any of those thoughts and feelings about any new weapons because I'm just exploding everything with my grenades and my shield throws and my hip fire funnel web and my Galahorn. Right now, I'm reviewing Tiny Tina's Wonderland, that Borderlands offshoot, right? And it's a looter and you collect different weapons and you play around with them. And a few hours in, I had this realization that I had a deeper connection with every single one of the trashy early game weapons I found in that game's campaign than I've had with any weapon across all of the Witch Queen expansion. I have to properly use my weapons in Tiny Tina in a way that I no longer need to properly use my weapons in Destiny 2. I don't even like the funnel web, but I use it because if I don't, everything else dies to everybody else's funnel web or their ability spam or whatever. Like I said, I know everyone's gonna roast this take, but for real, there is something wrong here. I can remember the precise way that so many classic guns of Destiny felt and sounded. And as I remember using them, I remember being behind cover, focusing on headshots, falling back when I didn't have enough throughput. After putting 80 hours or more into this latest expansion, I can't remember how any of the guns look, feel, sound, nothing. Where Stasis was an intelligent addition to the game that opened up a new style of play, Void 3.0 is this wrecking ball of bonus power that has closed off styles of play, most notably the one where we had to take cover and use weapons. I'm all for feeling powerful, for sure, but Void 3.0 and its accompanying mod economy just takes things way too far, and I think Destiny 2 is a worse game for it. On some level, I've always thought of the Strike playlist as the beating heart of the Destiny experience. This is the playlist that drops us back into Destiny's world in the most complete way, revisiting pivotal missions, reconnecting with memorable characters, the entire breadth of our capabilities employed as we carve a path through waves of fodder to climactic boss encounters. 
The strike playlist has undergone a lot of changes over the years. There's always been the base difficulty for each strike, which was woven into the campaign experiences, but there was, at various points and in different forms, heroic difficulties of those same strikes, which were the same, it's just that stuff had more health and hit harder. It was also the Nightfall difficulty, which back in Destiny 1 was as hard as it got, and wiping in those would send you back to orbit. That was always a really good time. I still recall, very fondly, how much time I spent in the Heroic Strike playlist during Destiny 1, particularly when it became a rotating playlist in The Taken King. I would just spend hours in this playlist, because this was such a sweet spot in terms of difficulty and pacing. Stuff presented a challenge without feeling frustrating, enemies took a few shots to bring down without ever feeling like bullet sponges, you had to play properly to stay alive, but nor were you getting one banged if you popped out of cover. Up to the Witch Queen, I really don't think that Destiny had arrived at a better, more balanced difficulty model in PvE activities than what we had during the days of the Heroic Strike playlist. Since then, I think the Legendary Campaign difficulty has surpassed that. Destiny 2 made a number of changes to the Strike playlist since it launched, but here's where things sit now. The Heroic Strike option is gone. There are now three options. The first is Vanguard Ops, which is a match-made activity that rotates through a handful of strikes. There's the Nightfall, which is a specific strike that rotates each week. It has selectable difficulty levels, with the lower levels being match-made and the higher levels requiring a pre-made group. That's important because if you want to get your weekly 100k pinnacle from that, you pretty much need a pre-made group. Finally, there's the Grand Master Nightfalls, which are vastly different from their base difficulty for lots of reasons, but mainly because champion spam. Those are also a set strike each week and there's only one difficulty for those. So right off the bat we have to say that Vanguard Ops is essentially completely broken at this point. I said earlier that it was unplayable and I 1000% believe that. That is not hyperbole. These strikes are not playable. You cannot play them because everything dies so fucking fast that it is just a meme. They're essentially a race to not fall behind the fastest member on your fire team since they will kill everything in an instant. And when the boss spawns, the boss is dead just as soon as their health bar appears. I mean, look at this. We have to do three of these Vanguard Ops each week to get a pinnacle, and there is no more mindless an activity in all of Destiny right now than these Vanguard Ops. The one exception to this is that, as of Witch Queen, Battlegrounds, which were a seasonal event from Season of the Chosen, have been spliced into the Vanguard playlist. These are the only times when that playlist feels right. Battlegrounds have been designed in the context of our burgeoning power in Season of the Chosen, and so when you play these, it feels good. When they pop, I'm like, yeah, nice, cool, I get to shoot some stuff, good times. Outside of this, I would describe the Vanguard Ops as a very broken aspect of Destiny that, similar to other parts of the game, has fallen into disrepair owing to its inability to dynamically scale with our power increase. I've always found it quite puzzling that so many people are like, don't complain about strike difficulty when the Nightfall exists, when I think the Nightfall playlist has its own problems. So first up, Nightfalls are pretty good overall, to be honest. They're the closest thing we have to heroic strike difficulty, and while champions are a mixed bag in GM Nightfalls and Master Raids, I think they're sort of fine here. I would be perfectly fine with booting up a match-made, rotating strike Nightfall playlist that just lets me roll through a variety of strikes while I kick back and grind out some bounties or catalyst progress. The problem is that I can't do that, because the Nightfall is a set strike each week, and I don't want to run the same strike over and over again just because it happens to be the only one tuned for the appropriate difficulty. Just let it rotate between all the Nightfall strikes, that will be fine. And this is a really down in the weeds point, but the 1550 Legend difficulty, the one that feels right because it's at the power cap and it rewards a pinnacle each week, that's fine to be a match made activity. Exactly the same as Master Wellspring, 1550 Nightfall strikes feel like the default experience properly tuned to our power level, so why do I need to go onto an LFG Discord to find people to do that activity? If you just remove the lock loadout restriction, you could let people match make into this and they'd equip what they needed to get the job done and it would all be fine. So that's my proposal, a Nightfall playlist that is essentially just the Heroic Strike playlist 2.0, where I rotate through different strikes, I matchmake with other players, I get to actually play the game instead of everything just dying before I even get there, and I get some decent rewards for doing it. I don't think that's an unreasonable ask, and the absence of something like this has always felt like this big missing piece of the Destiny experience. The final difficulty is Grandmaster Nightfalls, and I'm going to say that I don't personally enjoy GM Nightfalls, 
but I know a lot of people do. We all play Destiny for different reasons, and some people really like the build craft requirements that go into these, where specific group compositions and exotics allow you to break through what can feel like an impassable wall the first time you step in there. I certainly felt the satisfaction that comes from beating GM Glassway for the first time, but once I'd done it, I was like, yep, I definitely don't want to do that ever again. I just don't like the overall tuning of it, where normal strikes feel hilariously undertuned, GM Nightfalls just feel a touch overtuned, and with some of the more obnoxious strikes or encounters shaved back a little bit, I expect I'd enjoy those activities a lot more. Having said that, I think GM Nightfalls are the most complete, uncompromised activity within the strike playlist right now. They serve a specific function, and they do it well, and the people who enjoy them really enjoy them. If you're going to make any changes to the GM Nightfall activity, it feels like it'd be minor tweaking rather than wholesale restructuring or overhaul, which is what I think both regular Nightfalls and Vanguard Ops are in need of. The Strike playlist is very important to me. I absolutely would be playing vastly more Destiny if I had a functional Strike playlist, because I need a match-made activity that lets me feel like a Guardian without making me feel like a god. There's no activity that's doing that for me right now, which is why I think an overhaul of this playlist is so urgent. There is no better example of the uneven state of Destiny's 2 overall game health than Gambit. It's a game mode so flawed and so problematic that even if you disagreed with everything else I've said in this video, you are probably going to agree with at least some or all of this. Gambit being fucked is like the one thing that all Destiny players can agree on. So Gambit launched a few years back in the Forsaken campaign, an ambitious PvEVP hybrid game mode where Guardians would kill waves of enemies to harvest moats, they would dunk those moats to summon blockers for the enemy team, they would race to dunk enough moats to summon a boss and then race to kill that boss first. Keeping all this particularly spicy was the ability to invade the enemy team, depriving them of precious moats and healing the boss if you managed to kill any of them during the boss burn phase. When Gambit first launched, I don't think there was a more optimistic proponent of it than myself. I absolutely loved Gambit because I thought it had the potential to resolve a tension which to that point had existed at the heart of Destiny 2's PvP experience. To that point, the ability sandbox was really reined in, and we're all living in this double primary world, and we spent an entire year corner peeking with scout rifles. We didn't feel like guardians when we PvP'd in Destiny 2, but you absolutely felt like a guardian when you were competing in Gambit, because you were using absolutely every one of your capabilities to its fullest potential. It wasn't long though, until the Gambit experience was fully mapped in our heads, and every winning strategy essentially boiled down to one thing. Heavy weapons that could map Guardians. From Queenbreakers to Xenophage to Sleeper Simulant to Eyes of Tomorrow, this game mode has always been held hostage by the potency of heavy weapons combined with surprise attacks, since you never knew where an invader would appear, but they knew exactly where you were. This combined with the three round structure of Gambit made the experience very frustrating and very drawn out, so much so that Bungie committed to a sort of reworking of Gambit in the season of the Drifter. Gambit Prime remixed the Gambit experience into a single round rather than the best of three. It changed the way we dealt damage to the boss, putting more reliance on the buffs the envoys provided, as well as adding specific gear sets which would augment your capabilities aligned with certain role types, like an invader, an ad clear person, a moat harvester, etc. It was very ambitious, and you got the feeling that Bungie were doubling down on Gambit, making it a real centerpiece offering of the franchise. I mean, gear sets that provided that much utility in that way, that was basically a first for the franchise, so big things were happening in the world of Gambit. The problem was, well, a lot of things, but basically heavy ammo still undid all of this. I know it sounds reductive to lay the failures of Gambit squarely at the feet of heavy weapons, and surely there is a more nuanced analysis that speaks to the weird dynamic scaling of enemy damage output and the snowballing effect of certain invade windows and yada yada, and all that's true, but at the end of the day, Gambit Prime forced us to all stack together during the damage phase in this well of light thing, so you can imagine how fun that was for an invader who happened to have a rocket launcher in the chamber as they jumped through that portal. Gambit Prime released back in 2019, and it's no exaggeration to say that that was the last meaningful update to Gambit. After that, the game mode was further pared back and streamlined to be even faster, maps were removed, and those gear set ideas weren't carried forward. All of last year, Gambit was a bit of a joke, because the Primeval had no damage gating, and much like the rest of the game, the boss's health wasn't rebalanced to reflect our power levels. Thundercrash Titans wearing Curuses would melt the boss's health so fast that the game could barely process it. It looked like the boss's health bar would bug out as it emptied in an instant. 
The heavy ammo issue still persisted, where Xenophage and Eyes of Tomorrow in particular were just stupid. There was no counterplay there, and if an invader came through with a few eyes locked and loaded, and got off a nice early invade that robbed your team of 30 motes, it was essentially game over at that point. That brings us to the Witch Queen, where Bungie have done the impossible. They found a way to make Gambit worse. Witch Queen makes two major changes to Gambit, both of which are just band-aids that paper over Gambit's core problems without fixing them. The first is its approach to boss health, which now reintroduces damage gating to stop us from just melting the boss too fast. Do some damage, boss goes immune, kill the envoys, you can damage the boss again. This is a solution that is unfortunately necessary because our power as Guardians has grown exponentially, especially in stacked teams synergizing buffs. Bungie cannot design boss encounters with single uninterrupted health pools now, unless those health pools are so mountainous that your average unoptimized team is going to spend 15 minutes trying to burn that boss down. So yeah, I don't like damage gating either, but it's a necessary evil because the problem of our power, so to speak, has not been solved across the game. And to be honest, this solution would be kind of fine if it weren't for the invade mechanic, which heals the boss a huge amount on each kill, and invades are still very regular and extremely effective owing to the heavy ammo economy, which we'll talk about next. And so yeah, you get these situations where the boss phase just goes forever and shooting the boss feels kind of pointless because you know that you're probably just going to get invaded and one banged by a wolf pack round anyway which will heal the boss so shooting the boss just feels like a waste of time over the last few years gambit has just been something that we want to get over and done with quickly so that we can get our pinnacles or our ornament and then never touch it again this change prolongs matches in a game mode that nobody wants to play the other change was to the heavy ammo economy and this one is just like Wow. So, to this point, the single biggest issue across all of Gambit has been invaders being able to one-shot whoever they like as soon as they arrive because they have heavy ammo that lets them do that. Heavy ammo has been the single most disruptive force in the entire Gambit experience, so Bungie's solution to the problem of invaders having heavy ammo is for everyone to have heavy ammo. Now, each time you clear out a wave of enemies, you get a heavy ammo box and everyone on your team can claim that, so everyone has heavy ammo all the time. This means that anyone can invade now, as everyone has heavy. Obviously, the logic behind this is that you can also use heavy to defend yourself against an invade, but that's just not how the game plays, because we can't see the invader when they spawn in. They still get Pika's advantage, so to speak, when all they need is one shot and it's game over. Rather than balancing the impact of heavy ammo on Gambit, all this change has done is made it easier for anyone on the enemy team to invade and score free kills since they have heavy ammo all the time. At this point, when it comes to Gambit, there are a few things that are clear to me. Number one, Gambit's really broken. It's the most broken part of Destiny at the moment in my view. It showcases the problems with that power scaling, it's full of awkward design choices that are patch jobs rather than proper solutions, and its invasion mechanic enshrines frustration in a way that I don't think exists across any other part of the competitive Destiny experience. Secondly, I think it's really clear that to properly fix Gambit is a huge undertaking. The solutions to Gambit's issues are not minor tweaks, they are complete overhauls of core systems. In fact, I think that while I really like the idea of a competitive PvEVP experience, I would go as far as to say as I think the Gambit experiment has failed. Parts of it could be salvaged in another game mode built on a similar philosophy, but on a totally different set of design elements. And that brings me to my third point, which is I just don't think Bungie really has the appetite for salvaging Gambit. There was a recent tweet from Joe Blackburn saying that Bungie are playtesting further changes in Season 16, listing things like heavy ammo economy, the boss fight, invasion, cadence and power, etc. These are all things that have been substantially tweaked multiple times over the life of Gambit, and we are only further away from the potential of a fully functional Destiny 2 PvEVP competitive experience than we have ever been. I look at Gambit from a new player perspective, and I wouldn't want them to play this. For real, if I was trying to recruit someone to Destiny, I would legitimately brief them. Do not play Gambit. I think that when you have something that malfunctioning in the game, then it kind of needs to be decommissioned so that it can be either substantially reworked or permanently mothballed. As someone who really loved Gambit at the start and was so excited for what it could have been, I'm ready to say goodbye to Gambit. Like for real, Bungie have removed Forsaken from the game because they say they can't support it. I'd have much preferred Bungie put in the work to keep Forsaken in so that new lights could experience that content, rather than directing it towards keeping the zombified corpse of Gambit shambling along. Bungie have woven an awareness of their development bandwidth into the way we talk about Destiny. Well, as someone who's aware of that, I would say, stop supporting Gambit. 
put it in the vault, redirect the development effort elsewhere, ideally to a new PvEVP experience that rescues and repurposes the best parts of Gambit, or failing that to entirely new, different, unrelated content, or failing that to protecting the essential aspects of the legacy Destiny 2 experience that would have otherwise ended up in the content vault. Gambit has had its time, and it's time to move on. So first up, I gotta say, I am by no stretch of the imagination a PvP expert. I've always played Destiny's PvP, and with the exception of the double primary meta, I've always enjoyed it, but I've never taken it too seriously, nor have I been particularly good at it. I'm the guy that can bust out with a surprise 10 KD and hard carry a 6v6 one match, and then the next match I go like 0.2 KD. That's me, okay? So should you look to me for the definitive take on Destiny 2's PvP? No, you shouldn't. But I can give you my perspective as a casual player, which I think is valuable in its own way since most people who PvP in Destiny are probably going to be similar to myself. Over the last few years, I've certainly arrived at a sort of maturation of my view on what Destiny's PvP can or should be. I definitely recall going into Destiny 2's launch wanting things like a ranking system, better ranked rewards, a more balanced and competitive sandbox that rewarded gun skill over ability spam, etc. I certainly looked at the glory days of Halo's PvP, and I wanted Destiny to sort of ape that. The thing is, we sort of got that at the launch of Destiny 2, where the 4v4 double primary meta was basically the most balanced Destiny's PvP has ever been, but also the most boring. I learned a lot during that period about what makes Destiny's PvP distinct, and it wasn't its competitiveness per se, it was its power fantasy, combining the high time to kill of Halo with the movement and verticality of arena shooters, with the abilities and itemization of an RPG to deliver something very distinct. There's really nothing quite like Destiny's PvP, and I've certainly come to realize that the secret to a successful Destiny PvP sandbox is to keep those three things in harmony. Time to kill, movement and the RPG side of things. There's a lot more that goes into the overall PvP experience, but I think those are the most essential elements of the sandbox. As I've become more aware of these things, I've also become more aware of just how impossible Bungie's task of balancing these things is. New weapons being introduced, new exotics, new subclasses, new mods, new everything. A single newly introduced fragment has the power to completely disrupt the entire PvP meta. So I can't even wrap my head around how difficult it would be to keep the PvP game from completely toppling over at the start of every expansion. It did topple over last year with Beyond Light, where Stasis was so potent and so shitty to play against in a competitive environment that the first six months of Beyond Light were some of the worst PvP that Destiny has ever seen. Multiple rounds of nerfs would eventually bring Stasis to heal, but that was a very rough chapter. To the Witch Queen's credit, Void 3.0 has been far less toxic in terms of its impact on the PvP experience. Certain aspects of it, like Invis Hunters, are fucking annoying, but on the whole, playing against Void 3.0 is nowhere near as frustrating and rage-inducing as being frozen and shatter-dived every six seconds. Overall though, I gotta say that I think Destiny's PvP is in a pretty good spot right now. Coming back to what I said earlier, keeping time to kill, movement, and RPG in harmony is the most important equation in the sandbox, and they feel pretty harmonized right now. The weapon meta feels pretty diverse, the special ammo economy feels pretty good, our abilities are certainly on shorter cooldowns, but nowhere near what they are in PvE, and overall, I feel like most of my engagements come down to outplay and skill rather than cheese. That's not always going to be the case, obviously, but most of us have lived through a number of sandboxes, and I think this one right now is pretty good. Overall, playlist health is a little more of a mixed bag. 6v6 control continues to be the go-to experience, which is fine, and seasonal challenges push people into other playlists like Mayhem, which is nice. The competitive queue kind of only exists to hit your power cap faster at the start of a new expansion, and after that it's just kind of there. The true competitive Destiny 2 PvP experience is Trials of Osiris, which went through a lot of experimentation over the last year to revise its queue structure and rewards economy. On Sundays, a new flawless pool becomes available, which should, in theory, make it easier for non-flawless teams to face other non-flawless teams. But in reality, a lot of sweats are just resetting their cards before going flawless, so this is still an imperfect solution. Much better are the changes to rewards, where engram drops and a revised vendor interface allow you to chase specific weapons rather than just praying to the RNG gods. Trials is never going to make everyone happy because it's not meant to. It's specifically designed to reward the most skilled players and disappoint everybody else, which I don't think is a bad thing. 
The rewards that Trials offers are not so compelling as to leave people feeling disadvantaged if they don't obtain them, but that's always going to clash with the completionist nature of many people who play Destiny and want to collect all the things. Iron Banner is meant to be the PvP special event that is designed for everyone, but sadly that activity is very much in need of an overhaul. Right now it's impossible to chase specific weapons since there's no bounty or vendors to let you do that, so it's kind of pointless to play unless you just want to get some power level increases or maybe just try your luck I guess, bang your head against the RNG wall. The revision to Trials of Osiris provides a really good template for the potential revision of Iron Banner, so hopefully Bungie can control C, control V on that one at some point. Outside of all of this, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. It has been just over 900 days since the last new Crucible map was added to Destiny 2. To any outside observer hearing that figure, your first thought would be, well, obviously the PvP game is dead, right? Well, no, but it's definitely in a sort of stasis, no pun intended. Bungie have told us they're building internal capability to create new PvP content more regularly, and I'd love to believe them. It's just that they've said that so many times over the past few years that you kind of need to wait until they start delivering things before we start dishing out big high fives. And this is one of the really big reasons why I don't agree with this narrative that Destiny has never been in a better spot, because 900 days since new PvP content is really dire. PvP is not some distracting side content, it is an integral part of the Destiny experience, and back in Destiny 1, or even at the start of Destiny 2, we had a vibrant, dynamic PvP scene with lots of maps in rotation, new maps hitting regularly, new game modes, all sorts of stuff. Right now, we've definitely seen some improvements to Trials, and I think we have a great sandbox to play around in, but until we start seeing new PvP content, then we're always going to be living in the shadows cast by better times. This is fallen territory. We aren't safe here. I have to get you to the city. The final point I want to touch on is the new player experience in Destiny. Both how difficult and confusing that experience is, how it's becoming even more difficult and confusing, and why I think this really matters for the long-term health and success of the game. Right now, anyone who steps into Destiny for the very first time has an extraordinary journey before them, in a good way. Think of all the loot you've collected, the exotic quests you've completed, the raids you've done, the triumphs and emblems you've acquired. Imagine stepping into Destiny today and having all of that before you. That was essentially where I was last year, when I returned to the game after an extended break which kicked off about halfway through Forsaken. When I returned, all of my gear had been sunset, I'd never even heard of an Ascendant Shard, and so I had to figure all of this out. I was missing tons of exotics, and it took the better part of a full year to slowly purchase all of them from that exotic kiosk. The mod system was entirely new, and I had no fucking clue how any of it worked, nor did I have any mods, since they all dropped in previous seasons. I definitely recall finding Destiny very disorienting during that period, and that was as someone who was already deeply invested in both the world and the core gameplay loop. One thing I didn't have to go through though was the New Light experience, the quest line that would give you the absolute basics before just dumping you onto the star map, giving you a quick pat on the ass and wishing you all the best. That experience exists in this way because of content vaulting, where the Red War and a number of destinations were removed, and that served as a sort of introduction to the game, as your quest to restore your light opened up new abilities over time and eased you into the story of this massive universe of characters and events. Today, the new player experience is even worse with the removal of Forsaken. Now, content vaulting is just this thing that the community has kind of accepted because Bungie have said that they need to focus on new things rather than maintaining old stuff that very few people play. I do agree with that in principle, but it hits so different when Forsaken was removed from the game. That was a transformative expansion that restored the Destiny experience that we lost with the launch of Destiny 2, and it housed the single most important and emotive event in the entire Destiny timeline. I think preserving the history of this game matters, not only for posterity's sake, because I think seeing the death of Cade and the shattering of the Vanguard is a deeply important moment in the New Light journey. These are the things that ground this universe, that bind you to it, that create a level of connection and investment that goes beyond, hey, look at this cool gun I got. I can deal with random six-player seasonal activities being vaulted, but I really draw the line here. One day, three years from now, the Witch Queen campaign will be removed from this game and no one will be able to experience it. Is that acceptable to you? It is not acceptable to me. 
Setting aside the issue of content, there are other things that make the new light experience very difficult. The absence of matchmaking across the majority of activities that dispense worthwhile rewards is a problem, because new lights often don't have people to play with, and they don't necessarily know how to use tools like LFG discords. What if you didn't know how to use DIM, Destiny Item Manager? How annoying would it be to have to fly back to the tower to change weapons every time? The mod economy is the absolute worst component of the new light experience. This is actively hostile to new lights, since they're forced to follow a Twitter account and pray to the RNG gods that a mod they're chasing might be up for sale. It's like a fucking mobile game. I went through this last year chasing mods critical to my builds, and Bungie's solution to just sell one or two more mods each day is frankly pathetic. Why would you want to put new players through this? It makes absolutely no sense to me. We all make that joke like, Destiny's my my favorite game. I hate it. But less funny is the reality that most of us, people who really love Destiny, kinda can't recommend Destiny to anybody not already playing Destiny. There is no way that that doesn't, at some point, catch up with this game. It might not happen now, or next year, or the year after that, but one day this is really going to hurt this game. There needs to be a smooth on-ramp for the Destiny experience. It should be rooted in the most important campaigns and events that we all got to experience. It should give New Lights achievable goals to guide them in their first steps. It should allow them to achieve those goals without relying on third-party tools. And it should never, ever punish them for not having played previously. I know most of this stuff doesn't affect us who are already playing this game, but I think this stuff matters a lot because I love Destiny and I want to be able to share it with more people, but right now it is very, very difficult to do that. So, this has been a long video. Obviously, it was in part a review of The Witch Queen, and I hope I've done a decent enough job of celebrating The Witch Queen's successes, which I think are numerous and important. In critical areas like the campaign, storytelling, world design, and the raid, The Witch Queen is a brilliant addition to the game, with the legendary campaign in particular being a new pinnacle for the franchise, one that has the potential to cure what ails Destiny, because right now, I think overall game health is in a very rough spot. Now, this script has taken me about three weeks to finalize, partly because I've been playing the game and partly because my office got flooded. Those were fun times. In the time that I was writing this video, I was very interested to see a number of people come out with separate but related takes on what I'd call challenges with the core gameplay loop of Destiny. And I think the fact that all of these people are saying this kind of stuff suggests that maybe I'm not crazy. For example, Paul Tassie of Forbes released a video 12 days ago talking about power creep, where he wondered aloud, is this a problem? Probably. Nine days ago, Marco Stahl released a review of Destiny where he talked about the fact that making builds is cool and all, but it doesn't really matter since almost everything dies so fast anyway that putting any effort into a build almost feels pointless. Ten days ago, Mylan Games put out a brief clip talking about Destiny's over-reliance on champions and how it creates a lock and key model of encounter design, stifling build diversity and endgame. And three days ago, Datto put out a sort of follow-up to Mylan's video where he's like, I'm okay with champions, sort of, but I also need something else at endgame that I can fight that doesn't require me to run a precise loadout. So all of these people are coming at this from slightly different angles, but I think it all speaks to a similar point, which is that right now, the difficulty model is not working. I focused a lot on the bottom end of the spectrum here, saying repeatedly that the default difficulty of Destiny right now is not right, and it makes Destiny feel mindless and it weakens the focus on gunplay that is critical to the health of this franchise. Other people are talking about the upper end of that equation, which is that in more challenging content, we're pigeonholed into specific loadouts and play patterns because Bungie are overly reliant on champions. I think that's a byproduct of the fact that we're now so powerful that if your objective is extremely challenging content, it would be impossible for Bungie not to funnel that power into specific lock and key style challenges. Hence champions, hence match shields, and hence damage gated boss encounters. I think the solution to this is somewhere in the middle, literally. There is a middle tier of difficulty that this game is lacking and adopting it as the new baseline Destiny difficulty would not only make combat feel more engaging and tactical, would not only restore the primacy of gunplay, but it would also give you space to use the build that you have toiled to create. 
Solving this problem is a massive task, and assuming that Bungie want to tackle it, we're going to have to wait a while for some improvements, and that's not all we're waiting for right now. We're waiting for the other two revised subclasses, we're waiting for Gambit to get fixed or removed, we're waiting for PvP to be revitalized, we're waiting for the newly implemented weapon crafting system to be overhauled, we're waiting for the new player experience to be improved. That's a lot of waiting for a game that has apparently never been in a better spot. That's why I don't agree with that assessment. At the pinnacles of this franchise, The Taken King and Forsaken, there were still things on the horizon that we look forward to, but I don't recall those expansions having the same fundamental game health challenges that Destiny now suffers from. As much as I enjoy the new content that The Witch Queen delivers, it's these whole of game challenges that I think about when I consider booting up Destiny each day. And until they're resolved, I do expect I'll be playing less Destiny than I otherwise might be. While I may have a love-hate relationship with Destiny 2, I have a love-love relationship with my new Steel Series Destiny 2 peripherals. That's right, nerds. We've got a mouse, we've got a big-ass RGB mouse pad, and we've got a headset. All of them themed in that classic title screen white. You know, the one that used to send us blind every time we loaded up Destiny? We all hated that title screen, but I promise you, the colors work a hell of a lot better here on these peripherals. These bad boys aren't just for show, mind you. This mouse pad's got plenty of surface area and a nice, customizable RGB trim. I like it. The headset is based on the Steel Series Arctis 1, their award-winning model with a 3.5mm headphone jack so you can plug it into a PC or a PlayStation or Xbox controller, hell even a Switch if you're one of those weird Destiny players that also plays other video games. It has a detachable mic and an adjustable headband for a nice fit awesome, versatile piece of kit. My personal favorite item in this collection is the mouse, which is based on the SteelSeries Rival 5. I was using a different SteelSeries mouse, but I've permanently switched over to this one now since I love not only the look of it, but the feel of it. Fits really nicely in the hand, nine programmable buttons, five of those on the side for quick access. It's extremely precise, great weight, not too heavy, not too light. Plus, it's got that programmable RGB as well, so you can sync it to your mouse pad and your SteelSeries keyboard if you're using one, and it all looks awesome. SteelSeries kit is premium. Go and ask your friends. This stuff provides S-tier performance and is vastly more reliable than competing brands. I won't name them, but you know the ones. SteelSeries have worked hard to design and refine industry-leading peripherals, and their results speak for themselves, since more prize money has been won using SteelSeries peripherals than from any other peripheral manufacturer. The pros use it because they rely on it, I use it for the same reason, and now they come in a sexy Destiny 2 wrapper. Even if I wasn't sponsored by SteelSeries, I was going to be buying this stuff, no doubt about it. If you want to pick up some or all of this legendary kit, then I've got great news for you. You can use offer code SKILLUP at checkout to get a full 12% off. That's it. No hoops to jump through, no tricksy catch, just a straight 12% discount when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Do get in quick though, because this stuff is legitimately limited edition, and once it's gone, it's gone for good. So grab it while it's there, and if you do happen to miss out, well, don't forget that that discount code works on the entire Steel Series range, so you could grab something else instead if you like. There is a link below in the description and the pinned comment. Give it a click, check this stuff out for yourself. Whether you're a new light or a D1 Alpha vet, you're gonna be very happy seeing this stuff on your desk every day. Thanks Steel Series for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.